Hey everyone, uh, this is Gub Sheep from Dark Forest. Um, super glad to be here. Thanks to the EdCon team for having me. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about lessons from fully on-chain games uh, and some of the things that we have learned from Dark Forest. Cool, so first, just a quick introduction. Um, what is Dark Forest? For those of you who haven't played or heard of the game, Dark Forest is a procedurally generated a uh, fully decentralized MMORTS built with ZK Snarks on Ethereum. Um, you can see here, this is a little screenshot from uh, the game. The cool thing about Dark Forest is that all of the game logic and not just um, say like ownership or accounts or something like that runs on the EVM. And we used to run rounds of the game on Ropsin. Um, now we run these beta rounds on the XDI chain. And I just grabbed a little screenshot here from Dune Analytics, but you can see that um, during Dark Forest rounds, about 2,000 to 3,000 players, when actively playing the game, consume more gas than all of mainnet combined. So, you know, another one of those kind of forcing functions on the importance of scalability for applications like ours. And a little bit about myself, uh, I'm Gubsheep, I work on Dark Forest. Um, I also work on applied zero knowledge R&D and a couple of educational and eco dev projects like ETH University, which I know Scott is gonna be talking about tomorrow as well. Um, and you can find me on Twitter at, at Gubsheet. <coughs> cool, so the first question that I want to try to answer today is why build games on the blockchain at all? And I'm sure for a lot of folks who either are in crypto or are thinking about jumping into crypto, I'm sure we've all had the experience of looking at a dApp or something and being like, oh, wait, like this is like, you know, insert app here, but decentralized. And what decentralized actually means in the context of, you know, a given app is that it's just worse. You know, you have something that's, that's perfectly fine um, and decentralization doesn't actually make it better. <clears throat> so first we're gonna try to answer the question, uh, why is crypto gaming interesting? And in my head, I have three answers to why people build crypto games. There's the broke answer, there's a woke answer, and then there's the bespoke answer. And obviously we're most excited about the bespoke answer. So the broke answer is that crypto is exciting for building games because it's really easy to build Ponzi schemes and scams on crypto. Um, so for folks who still remember from 2017, 2018, uh, this is a screenshot from FOMO 3D, which, which was basically a tongue in cheek, kind of like Ponzi scam slash, um, exit scheme scam. Um, and it was really fascinating, I think, from just like a mechanical perspective, but <laughs> I think this was one of the apps that um, made crypto gaming feel like, oh, it's just, it's all about gambling. It's all about scamming people. Um, that's not what we are particularly interested in today. And I'm, I'm glad that the space has moved from uh, this sort of experiment. So the woke answer to this, which I think is the dominant thesis for a lot of crypto games today, especially the ones that are receiving a lot of attention, is that crypto allows you to build money, uh, to use money APIs to build digital worlds with real consequences. So real meaning economic here. So for example, like, oh, you know, imagine a game where if I like steal your planet or something, that's like me taking hundreds of dollars of economic value uh, from you. <clears throat> And the key thing here is that like, even though blockchains are harder to build on, they provide these really easy to use um, native and permissionless APIs into value itself. So, you know, a lot of the earliest examples of this kind of stuff were like arguably the first crypto games were like these like NFT collectible games, which also raised a lot of interesting questions and have intersections with like, what is art? What is ownership? Um, so we've got this like screenshot from CryptoPunks here. Um, there were a lot of collectible games that people have been uh, building since you know, 2017, 2018. We've got CryptoKitties here in Axie Infinity, which has been um, drawing a lot of attention and making waves lately. Uh, and then we also have uh, TCG games like Gods Unchained or Skyweaver, where you've got cards <clears throat> that are ERC721 tokens, uh, and then battles happen off chain. And I think that these, this woke reason for building crypto games is really exciting in my head for two reasons. The first is that it allows games to become more immersive um, because when you put something at stake, the game feels more real. Um, and that's something that's really important to building a compelling gaming experience. It's why, you know, 
in, in kind of an orthogonal direction, VR and, and graphical advances are so exciting uh, when we think about games. Here, if you have a game with real economic consequences, um, then that provides a different uh, and perhaps even more powerful uh, dimension of immersivity. And the second thing that's really exciting about this is that it allows these games to incentive align communities and dev teams. So now when the community feels staked in the success of or the adoption of a game, then that means that the community is both incentivized to and empowered to uh, build on top of the game as well. But I think that the current dominant line of thinking in crypto games still has a number of weaknesses. So first off, a lot of these games, especially NFT collectible games, where the only thing that lives on chain is essentially an ERC-721 token, um, a lot of these games are more speculative asset classes than games. And um, you know, I saw this uh, great tweet the other day, um, which said, crypto games will never be sustainable as long as the market around the game is more fun than the game itself. Um, I think that if we really want to fully unlock the power of games, um, to have mainstream appeal to draw people in for intrinsic reasons rather than financial reasons, we have to build games that are actually fun for reasons other than speculation. The other thing that's uh, kind of a weakness, or in fact, a really major weakness, and is kind of the subject, the second half of this presentation, is that a lot of these games aren't fully crypto games. So for example, ownership is on chain, but game logic or identity or permissions is off chain. Um, and I remember there's this tweet from Absa back in uh, earlier this summer where a really popular game had just, uh, you know, banned a large bot farm. And to me, the two things that kind of stuck out about this were like, one, <clears throat> first of all, I think that crypto native games or something that truly has, you know, a decentralization ethos ought to enable things like bots and automations and programmability, um, third party development. And second of all, the fact that there is someone who has admin permissions who can prevent people or ban someone from playing a games it, from playing a game is a kind of another red flag that maybe we're not you know leaning into the full ethos or the full power of decentralization now why do we care about this though this isn't just like an ideological or you know like purist sort of view on why uh, decentralization or crypto nativeness is important for games when you build a fully crypto native world, you actually get a lot of really interesting emergent properties. So now we get to the bespoke thesis, which is basically that fully crypto native games are powerful because they enable permissionless interoperability. And rather, that rather than describing what that means, uh, I'm going to show some examples that we've seen <clears throat> from these very early on experiments in Dark Forest. Um, so one of the first things that has been really exciting about building this game is realizing that when you build a truly crypto native dApp that is permissionless <clears throat> um, and where the game logic just lives in a smart contract API, the game is client agnostic. Anyone can programmatically interact with the game in whatever way that they'd like. So when we initially started out, we provided an open source client to the dark forest contracts, and then we built out a plugin system. And we quickly saw a very vibrant community emerge around plugin development. Um, we had these people writing things like visualizations, automations, chaining automations to build up to artificial intelligences to play the game. Um, we had people build things like, uh, you know, a remote snarker, which is basically like allows you to prove uh, ZK snarks in a remote web server that you hook into your game separately. Um, recently, we saw Georgios from Paradigm uh, with the aid of Kobe and a few other folks, build out a third-party Rust client with no input from us. And this was also really interesting because, so, so this basically allows you to play Dark Forest in a terminal UI. Um, <clears throat> and uh, basically it just like implements all of the networking and everything from scratch. And in order to get this working, uh, apparently they had to, you know, deal with compatibility issues and, and figure out compatibility issues between the Rust Arcworks ZK Snark proving tool stack and IDEN 3's uh, CIRCOM and SNARK.js stack, which is super interesting. Dark Forest, um, and if you've heard some of our presentations before, you might've heard how a lot of ZK stuff is the crux of what goes on and of, of how Dark Forest enforces like a fog of war. Um, we saw in the last couple of rounds, people started building remote miners uh, such as Project Sofon with their um, you know, Rust miner, but also recently these uh, two different teams in the last round 
which built out and open sourced GPU miners for exploring the dark forest universe. Another really exciting thing from the last couple of months is the first interoperable third party contracts and marketplaces that have been built on top of dark forest. So um, the broadcast market was built by Blaine and Jacob from Project Sofon. And, and basically what this allows you to do is it allows you to put bounties on other players' planets for other players to broadcast the locations of those planets. This is a mechanic you might be familiar with if you have heard of you know, the Dark Forest Thought Experiment or have read the Three Body Trilogy. Um, but what's essentially happened here is this is not just a client plugin or a third party automation. This is something where a team independent of the core devs has gone in and built a new feature for the game. And this is really the power of permissionless interoperability. Someone else can come in and build like an escrow contract or a marketplace or a guild or a DAO um, on top of the game, a nested game within the game. And that doesn't require any sort of support or like, you know, business development or whatever from, from the core team that's building um, the core smart contracts. Uh, last round, we also saw three separate teams um, build out uh, artifact marketplaces. So artifacts are, you know, they conform to the ERC 721 spec and they're these items that you can find in the game. Um, it's been on our list of to-do items actually to build out an artifact swapping or trading interface. Turns out we didn't have to because last game, three independent teams came out with artifact marketplaces, um, which was really, really awesome to see. Um, and you could sort of imagine, you know, in the far future, maybe even more of the game could be decentralized. You could have game modes that live in auxiliary contracts that are sort of views into the core dark force contract. You could have new resources or objectives or even, you know, something like satellites or something that that all lives in third party contracts um, that players can opt into if they choose to make that a part of their gameplay experience. And a last shout out that I'll just make is that uh, we're collaborating with another team that's building an even more complex uh, game with ZK mechanics um, that are beyond dark forests. Uh, and this is gonna be really exciting because players should be able to script in solidity things like battle strategies, um, you know, combat tactics and, and stuff like that. So be on the lookout for uh, this game from Ludens. So all of that gets us to our final question here, which is, you know, what is crypto native in the context of gaming and why is it important? Um, I argue that crypto native games are games that are maximally on chain. The source of truth for the game data is the blockchain, not a server. The game logic and rules are implemented in smart contracts. The game is developed in accordance with open ecosystem and open source principles and the game embraces real world digital value, that sort of money native APIs we talked about. So in particular things that aren't crypto native games include things like you know, a mobile shooter with a crypto wallet integration, or say like a TCG or collectible game with ERC 721 cards, but off chain battles, um, or, you know, and this is, this is a really funny one to me, DeFi app, playful skin, or lots of emojis. Um, I think that these things are, exciting and powerful in their own right. And this isn't to say that only, you know, crypto native games, fully crypto native games can be successful commercially or artistically. But I think that crypto native games are the most interesting and important to look at to understand the full potential of blockchain for building digital worlds and where the space is going. Um, and yeah, as far as the why, you know, we've seen through these examples, permissionless interoperability means that players can build the game experience, not just core devs. It means that other games can hook into your game to share assets, identity systems, mechanics, and more without needing like a support team or a BD team or anything like that. Um, and players can build anything from marketplaces to DAOs, to nested games, to new resources, to automations, alternate clients, interoperable assets, shared reputation systems. I know there's a lot of excitement floating around with lately with uh, the M word. But, you know, there's still a long way to go. Um, as we've mentioned in previous talks, if you've seen any of them, we think that ZK Tech is going to be required to build more compelling on-chain game mechanics. Scalability is a huge bottleneck. DevX is a huge bottleneck. We obviously need more devs to come into the space and get acquainted with this ZK Tech or, or Ethereum application development. And then application design patterns are, are definitely something that's still being iterated on. Um, but we think that this is a really exciting direction, and, and we hope that crypto native gaming can be one of the answers to the question Vitalik posed at last ETCC, uh, what happens after DeFi? If you're interested in helping us build this future, um, we've got a hiring announcement actually out on Twitter recently, and you can check out our blog um, to get a link to that. Um, you can support Dark Forest on Gitcoin. Dark Forest is supported by you know, grants and donations completely. Um, and you can check out the educational initiatives uh, that we support like ETH University and Reboot. Um, DM's open. Thanks for having me and uh, enjoy the rest of EdCon. <laughs>